Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to uh, have all, all of you all join uh, me today. Uh, my name again is Tamika uh, Sitchin Spruce. Um, I am a physical justice activist. I am um, also a, a, black, a lead black initiatives coordinator. So one of my uh, jobs is to, here at um, FDRC, to, you know, bring light to some of the issues um, that Black disabled people are experiencing um, today in Michigan, but then also uh, nationwide. And so I've developed um, a series, a webinar series called Being Black and Disabled, and that really gives you an insight on the um, um, multiple experiences of African Americans with disabilities. And so today, this month, with it being uh, Disability Pride and BIPOC uh, Mental Health Month, I have the great doc Dr. Zakia um, um, Mabry. Mabry. Um, here today, um, so she can you know, give you some insights how it is being um, an African American woman living with disabilities. I'm really excited to have her today. So let's jump right into it. Um, so, welcome. Um, Dr. Suki, how are you doing? I'm well. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, it's glad to have you. So if you can just uh, give the audience um, some background of who you are. Thank you. My name is Dr. Zakia Mabry, as mentioned. I am a disability advocate. I have been working in the area of human capital and diversity, equity, and inclusion for close to 20 years. So I'm dating myself. Um, and it's been quite a journey. I consider myself to be a storyteller. I share my lived experiences, and I also promote those stories of others who are marginalized groups. We'll get into that by talking about intersectionality. But most of all, I am a, a storyteller about mental health because at a very young age, I was diagnosed with a mental health condition. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so let's get right into, you know, some of the questions or, you know, our cover. A discussion. So I know you also describe, I believe I see that you have uh, multiple, you describe yourself as multiple disabilities. So can you share a little bit of, of that and more of the mental illness as well? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So back in high school, after a traumatic event, I was sexually assaulted, violently raped. I experienced, uh, it was one of those we all have those moments in our life that's a defining moment. And that was one of them. But shortly after that, and experiencing a lot of challenges, I was placed in special education. And I actually had a teacher who told me that he did not believe I was college material because he never had anyone in his class that wanted to go to college. And so that was really, um, I had a lot of shame and hurt and guilt and a lot of emotions, but I talked to my parents who were great advocates and they still are for me. And I had a meeting and we um, had the reasonable accommodations for my SAT. I wanted to originally go into the military as a commission officer, went to ROTC. That didn't happen because of some of my challenges, but at a young age, I was actually misdiagnosed, the original diagnosis, but then um, later on in life, I have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety disorder. And I think this is a conversation that's great that we're having it right here, right now at this moment, because as you said, this is Minority, minority Mental Health Awareness Month. It's also, we just celebrated the 31st anniversary of the passing of the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. But also, if you're watching the Olympics, as many people are, or at least looking at the headlines, there have been two gym, um, athletes who have um, also come out and said that they're taking their mental health seriously and taking a step back and to regroup to make sure that they're taken care of 
um, on an emotional and mental level. And I think that's so important. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely uh, true. Everything, everything uh, that you said is very interesting with Simone Lyles and, you know, to see how, you know, society is reacting to that. But, you know, she's um, a perfect illustration. It's okay, you know, say, to say, I need a break, I need to get, you know, my mental health, you know, to kind of say, it's with uh, Naomi, you know, who's the, uh, also have, you know, spoken out about that. So a prime example, even with people who are athletes, who, you know, society is, you know, physically strong, but you got to be mentally, you know, strong or even more Amen. strong, you know, so that that's definitely true. Um, also, as I'm listening to you, you know, and it seems to me that it was trauma that, you know, caused uh, the mental illness. So can you speak a little bit more on that, like the complexities or how, you know, in the African-American community, how trauma is? Well, I'm, cl- I'm glad you mentioned that, Tamika, in the African-American community, because oftentimes teenagers are misdiagnosed. And uh, I think that it's important that we look at that. Oftentimes, um, practitioners want to just throw medications up um, at the individual or tell the parents to um, have their child on medication. But also you need a combination. Statistics show that you need uh, a combination of psychotherapy and also medication. And so as I continued my journey in life and progressing, um, trying to figure out what my calling was, I continued with the psychotherapy. I'm in, I'm in therapy now. And I wouldn't be an author, CEO, or a consultant if I didn't have that person there to help um, balance me and give me those tools um, to navigate life because it's a little different and there's stigma attached to having a mental illness. And I realized that. And that is one of the reasons why early on in my career, I didn't want anyone to know. I thought it was a, a shameful secret. But now I realize that my disabilities the mental health ones, even the physical one that I have, um, are all my superpower because I navigate the world differently than let's say maybe an able-bodied person or another person who has a disability. And I've learned to do that because I had to make things work with my reality, how, how I process information in a world where people might process information differently and have the business, um, in a different way. Speaking uh, um, about your mental health, you might get pushed back, pushed back from friends and family, um, also in the workplace from supervisors when you ask for a reasonable accommodation. But I am here to tell you, a person who has been having uh, worked in um, many traumatic environments, toxic environments, just keep showing up and make sure that you're aligned with an organization that actually sees your value. And you might say, how do you do that? By research and, and talking to people. Because oftentimes people don't want to show their numbers. When I say people, I'm talking about organizations don't want to show their numbers on under, underrepresented groups. But you can also use LinkedIn. That's one of my favorite tools. That's how we met. Um, <laughs> you can ask someone, hey, I'm thinking about applying for a position at XYZ company. What has been your experience working there? And I have like maybe a, um, a virtual coffee chat with them because one thing that um, organizations often do sometimes is talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And how do you know if they're walking the walk? By talking to other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and a mouthful, really great, you know, information and everything. So thank you for that. We're going to get more into, you know, the, uh, the details of, you know, having a professional life, personal life with living with mental illness. Now we'll go back for a minute, minute, uh, a moment with uh, after the initial incident and, you know, as a young woman, uh, how was that for you in navigating, you know, school and, you know, things like that? Um, it, it was challenging. I did not, because of, I realized there was a stigma. People didn't want to talk about it. If you said that you had a mental illness, oftentimes you were shunned um, or even a learning disability because I have a learning disability as well. I I learned um, to keep that really close to my chest. 
it wasn't until I became um, aware of this organization at that time was called USBLN, which is now called Disability In, that I learned that actually sharing my story with other people is quite impactful. And I, I, I was surrounded by an array of mentors who were really uh, making impact in their own industries, whether it was in the banking industry, consulting industry. Um, there was different types of industries, but these were leaders who were advocates for individuals with disabilities. And some of those individuals actually had disabilities themselves, like John Kemp, for example, example, or Andy Amparato, um, who are very vocal about their disabilities. And so I, I, I paid attention, took notes, met, with, met up with a lot of them, and asked them questions about how do they handle certain situations in the workplace. Because mind you, I still was working in HR suite in the federal government and or private sector while I was learning more about myself. And so I learned from them. I also learned from the students sometimes that I would work with um, who had uh, disabilities and about how they navigate it. And sometimes you also have to learn from what doesn't work, right? Sometimes you have to burn your finger to learn the stove is hot. <laughs> and so maybe it's how you're approaching me, the person with a disability, sometimes how I'm approaching the situation. So it was difficult. To answer your question, it was very difficult. And I haven't said um, now that I'm 100% all the time comfortable in environments. But one thing I can tell you is I keep showing up. Yeah, yeah. Now that's how you, you do that. You know, you keep showing us. Would, you, would that be your recommendation to other um, Black young women who may be dealing with mental illness? What would you say to them? I was saying... Be your authentic self. You have beautiful, beautiful skills inside of you, and the world is waiting to see what those are. If you want to work in a certain industry, perhaps you should reach out to someone who you think is doing something amazing and have a chat with them, ask them to be your mentor, and maybe later on in life, they would become your sponsor. A sponsor is someone who would act on your behalf, even when you're not in the room. Be very careful who you associate with because there's oftentimes people there who are your fake cheerleaders. And I think we all know those type of individuals. Yeah. They're all going to be haters, people who don't see the potential in you. But as long as you see the potential in you, that's all that counts. To have those cheerleaders, those people, I call it your tribe. The tribe around you who's going to want to see you do your best. They're not in competition with you. They just actually want to see you excel. And I would say that that's one of the key things that I would tell a young person, I would tell someone who is in my age group or who is more seasoned than I, because even I right now go through times where I'm having self-doubt, anxiety, where I have to t do self-talk to myself and remember to work on those skills that I've learned in therapy and also in my formal education. I know that we're human and we all, we all have times where we're not feeling our best, but it's okay. Keep showing up. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really great, and, and that's you know great advice that you have to keep showing up. And and I, I like what you said also in your journey that you are connected to a nonprofit, or you know you found you know your tribe. So you know, say I mean, that's that's a great a thing as well for you know people to do. You know, in my my journey. With, you know, any type of disability, but in this case, it's illness, you just need to find, you know, find your tribe, find that, you know, not problem mm -hmm. help you, you know, so those skills, and you know, life. So, yes, you have a uh, great example of that. So, if you could talk about your college experience, you know, you're a doctor, you have a, uh, yes. a doctor, so can you talk a little bit? about that? Um, in college, undergraduate school, I attended Virginia State University for the, most of my undergraduate years. It was It's a HBCU in um, Southern Virginia. And it was a rich experience. I met um, a few lifelong friends. But I will say that it was a bit challenging me because when you go to undergrad, I don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have your parents right there to advocate for you. Like I said, my parents were an advocate when I had the situation with the teacher. So I had to learn how to take off my training wheels, so to speak, and start advocating for myself. And, and I realized that sometimes when it was above my, well, let's say pay grade, 
as they say. That's when I would call my parents and they will make a quick trip down to um, VSU and handle whatever it was I couldn't handle. But I also learned that those core friends that I hung out with um, at college, they had my back. They had my best interests at heart. And we're, we're still friends to this day. Uh, we may not talk every single day, but, you know, if something major happens in each other's lives, we're there. So I say this to say that those who are in, perhaps in undergrad or graduate school um, have genuine friendships with people, not surface level. Get into the deep conversations because these are people who are going to be your network for life who you can call upon when you need um, them or when they need you. Yes, yes, yes. And did you, uh, in, um, in order to complete school, did you u- utilize the student college services? Yes, okay. thank you for bringing that up. It's so important. <laughs> yes, I utilized um, the career planning and placement and also the disability office on campus for students with disabilities. I actually had a note taker. I was able to have longer times for tests. Sometimes the tests were modified. And I used this throughout the trajectory of my college experience. And I often talk to people who may tell me they have ADHD or this disability or that disability, and they say they're struggling in school. And then I tell them about reasonable accommodation, and you will be amazed at how many individuals are not aware that is the they have the right to ask. I mean, you got to show documentation, but they have a right to have reasonable accommodations. I will tell you, yes, there's going to be some um, educators who may not, um, especially if you're like me, who might, I might not look like I have a disability. I've heard that so many times in my life. It's a microaggression, very hurtful, because what does someone who have a disability look like? <laughs> um, but show up, advocate for yourself, because no one's going to advocate for yourself like you have the potential to do. And if you're having struggles with advocating for yourself, find someone who can be that ally for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true that some professors are not so nice. And as you said, with having a physical disability, people would take it as serious, you know. So there's a lot of um, stigmas which you'll talk about later, you know, that's a attached to it, yeah. And, and I don't think I really like what you said um, about your parents had to let you go, you know. So there's, we do have a lot of um, viewers who are parents. So what would be your uh, recommendation or advice to them on how to let the child go, you know, college? Um, I, I would say especially since there's so much information out there now. We now have the World Wide Web. We have so many resources at our fingertips. I wouldn't say just let them go and just say, like how someone was smoking a quick cold turkey. I wouldn't say do that and stop helping them because my parents are still my advocates now. Even in the workplace when I was working in the federal government, since they're more senior to myself, more life experiences, Liz experiences, I would ask them for their advice, but they didn't literally go there and have to speak to someone necessarily, but give them the tools on how to start approaching situations for themselves. Because you, you, most times you're not going to be able to have that person in a room where you're talking to that middle manager who is asking you, why do you walk around with a notepad and take notes all the time? What are you slow or something? And I use that example because that was said to me before, because I forget information because I have a traumatic brain injury. So I walk around with a notepad in the office I smile and someone calls me in their office and ready to take notes. And I was I asked, was I slow? Did I have to write down everything? So we also have to practice kindness. That's my next point. And that's something that everyone can do at any given time and give people grace. And if you have a question about something, it's not always what you're asking. Sometimes it is, but not always. But also it's how you're asking the question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, you know, the thing. Uh, that you said. So once we, you already uh, touched upon it, we'll go like deeper into like the professional, um, you know, workplace. Did you ever um, felt the need to hide your disability or did you uh, have to like receive accommodations? And how did you navigate all that or when that person said, you know, made that horrible comment? How did you navigate those types of situations? Tamika, 
talking about disclosing your disability is one of those topics that make a lot of people uncomfortable. And I can admit that I have been very uncomfortable having a conversation about when to disclose. Should I disclose during an interview? Should I disclose as soon as my first day of work? Um, and I believe it is very unique of, um, in its individual base, based on your disability and based on your role and responsibility. I personally start finding out for myself, it's best to disclose when we're going over expectations and um, procedures in the office with the supervisor. I can say, this has worked best for me. Working remote when I'm working on tedious activities, this or that, whatever the um, reasonable accommodation I might need for that particular position. Uh, from there, I understand that some people who are not familiar with disabilities or reasonable accommodations, I, in my personal experience, some people have been very uncomfortable with the conversation. However, I, I know my rights. So I would also appeal, I would um, implore you to know your rights about your organization and your rights is simply with the ADA. Uh, if you might need to have an HR person in there, make sure that they're also aware of ADA because just because you work in HR does not mean you are the subject matter expert in working with individuals with disabilities or diversity, equity, and inclusion. So make sure the person actually has knowledge. And you're like, well, how can I make sure of that? Well, you can ask questions. You can ask um, how many individuals here actually have a request for reasonable accommodations. There's certain metrics that are to be kept in an organization. And if you can't find it on their website, then you can ask the, what some people may think are the tough questions. And then ask where is the reasonable accommodation policy to make sure that you're, you're well informed and what is the process in that organization for requesting it. And I will tell you that I've been working EEO before for many years. It doesn't have to be on a specific form. You can send an email saying, I need these things. You can also say it verbally, but also there's a resource called the Job, Accommoda Job Accommodation Network, Dan, who has a lot of information based off your disability type. For example, if you have um, anxiety, cancer, whatever the disability is, you can go to there and you can actually look up on the website and you can call. An employer can call and employees can call to um, get more information. And most services are free of charge. Oh, wow. That's, that's great information you know, for people to have. I, I didn't even uh, know that. <laughs> I ashamed to say that, but yeah, that's <laughs> it's fine. For people to know. Um, so you know, I know that you also are self-employed as um, a consultant and speaker, and so you know, going transitioning from actually working for somebody, you know, to yourself, is it? Do you see it as it? Is it easier? Uh, living you know, with uh, your disability, being self-employed compared to me, working under somebody, or just to I would say overall, it's been a better experience for me because a lot of the stressors that I had when I was a W two employee, meaning I worked for an organization, was around my reasonable accommodations and simple ones that cost zero money. I wasn't working on cleared information, even though I have a you know security clearance. I was told, oh, no, you can't work from home on that project or you can't do this. And it was attitudinal barriers that I had to deal with that then would trigger my disabilities, physical and my emotional disabilities. So uh, it was actually because of my um, disabilities, actually my physical one, I have a, um, something wrong with my foot. I had to have surgery. It's a long story. But after that, I ended up leaving the workforce and going full throttle with my, my um, business, which has been was established in 2015. But I'm finding a, a lot less stress. As a consultant, I'm able to just uh, diagnose problems or come up with solutions uh, to issues that individuals are having in their organization. And I'm able to develop curriculum, facilitate training. And it seems to be a little less stress because the time frame I'm giving, okay, this is a suspense date. Okay, got it. I can create the information and facilitate it. And it's not anybody micromanaging me about how come this isn't done. It's done. I'm getting kudos 
from the client and also the participants in the in the training. So it makes me feel good. So it's very rewarding. And how is that different? One may ask from when you were working as a consultant from an organization. Well, then it, I had to deal with people. And it's not that I'm not good with people. Some people don't understand how to deal with an individual who has maybe a fibromyalgia flare up. If I'm saying today is not a good day, they might think I'm a slacker. Or if I have to go to physical therapy, oh, why is Zakia off again today? But I'm getting my work done. I'm excelling. But you still have to deal with the biases that other people have. So to answer your question, it's been more rewarding for me and less stress um, being a business um, consultant and working for myself. And I am very thankful to God for all the opportunities that I've had. And I really uh, enjoy doing it and, uh, and speaking across the globe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an entrepreneur as well. So yeah, I know the the the, the drive is definitely a very great option, you know, for people to, you know, to to do, you know, if you have the drive and motivation and passion, definitely look into you know, starting your own business as well. So this is definitely great. Um so another thing I want to go into more now is the personal, if you don't mind. Um, so, um, how though are you? Uh, do you have children or? I don't have any biological children right now. Um, I, no, not at this time. Yeah, so like, the, the reason why I ask that is like, have you thought about, or do you have any feelings around you know, having children with, you know, a mental illness or being in a relationship with a partner. Do you have any feelings towards that? Or I would say right now, uh, because I'm more secure in who I am and whose I am, I'm very transparent about my expectations and relationships. And I definitely do want to have children. I've worked really hard throughout my career, so now I'm financially stable, and I will say that dating early on, it was difficult to disclose to individuals about my mental health impairments. I remember one time I was dating this attorney from Minnesota, and when I shared this with him, like, like it, the communication kind of faltered, and we really didn't talk for a lot, and we broke it off, but now we're cool, we're cordial, but it really hurt me to my core because I'm like, this is who I am. That's just like me telling you, I was telling him the analogy that if I had, um, I, I don't remember the analogy I used, but I gave some analogy. I'm like, so you're saying I'm still the same person. So what changed beside me telling you that I have this diagnosis? It was very hurtful, but now I understand that if someone cannot um, accept me, and I mean all of me, then it's not meant to be. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely true, you know, that for people to, you know, understand, not to get caught up, you know, uh, being felt that way, though you will feel that the relationship doesn't work out, but, you know, just letting people know, hey, this is me, this is what I'm dealing with, you know, and, and you have to love me for, you know, who I am. So, Good advice. Um, and so I just want to let the audience know if you have any questions uh, for Zakia, uh, please put it on the um, comment section of the uh, Facebook Live this morning right now, and we'll get to the Absolutely. And I also wanted to talk about um, self care a little bit. Because I, I used to be on social media frequently, but I was noticing that it was maybe not the best move for me with some of the things I'm trying to accomplish at this time. So I think it's been um, several weeks since I've been on social media, but it's because I have different things going on in my life, some excellent and great and exciting that I will share with everyone soon. And some of it, you know, dealing with family. And I have to take a step back and take care of myself. I think that's very important for a lot of people. Sometimes you just have to let people know it's nothing against you, but I'm taking a little me time right now. 
And so I think that's important that you're, we're, we are all able, whether you have a disability or not, to articulate to people when you need to take a break. Yeah, yes. What are your thoughts about that? Your health and everything, your well being. Mm-hmm. Social media can be, you know, it's too much at times, very distracting. Sometimes I, I look at my Facebook, it's like, I don't need to watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> We have a you know, a Facebook or whatever, social media, because of all of these. So, yeah, that's very um, important what you um, have shared. And so, if you could talk about like specific instances, you could talk about a lot of experiences, but can you bring us back to specific instances of where you encountered racism and ableism? Yes, I will talk about um, one time, well, multiple times, being in meetings, and I not, well, this goes in a little bit into the intersectionality conversation, and intersectionality, of course, was coined in 1989 by um, Kimber, Kimberly Crenshaw, and it talks about the overlapping identities that individuals have. For example, I call myself a diversity triple threat because I'm a Black woman. And I have multiple disabilities. So when you're a marginalized individual, sometimes you don't know which one are you being discriminated against. <laughs> is it because I'm a woman, because I'm Black, um, or is it because I have my disability? But I do know that I feel that I have been treated differently in the workplace in certain settings. For example, being at the table in a meeting and I'm they, there's a time for you to give a comment. I give a comment, raise my hand. What about this, you guys? And then you hear, but then a few moments later, someone who does not look like me says the same thing and it's the best idea. Um, Another one I gave earlier was I take copious notes in the workplace because I forget information. Um, Being asked by my supervisor, who was the director of EEO, if I was slow or something, why do I always walk around with a notepad and a pen? You know, that's another microaggression that also is discriminatory um, against individuals with disabilities because being called slow, when I, it brought back memories of when I was in that special education class in the back of the building in high school. It, that wasn't very pleasant, some of the things that children said. But the things that children say, they turn into adults and they say the same thing. That's why I firmly believe we have to start protecting microaggressions when they happen. Oh, Zakia, you're you're requesting a reasonable accommodation. Oh, why are you working from home? You don't look disabled. Well, again, what does someone who looks disabled look like? Why are you wearing your hair like this? Can I touch your hair? No, please don't touch my hair. Um, you, you know what? You look very different from how I imagined. Well, how did you imagine? Oh, I didn't realize that you were going to be black. I've had that happen before. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, because how I uh, enunciate my, my words, maybe, or my voice, I don't know, it's a squeaky voice. <laughs> um, but there's so many different situations. Um, so I, I wouldn't say all of it could be because I'm Black. It could be a number because I'm a woman. One time I gave an amazing presentation for a federal agency, and I had a line around the table trying to talk to me afterwards. Well, my colleague, who was junior to me, he went completely off when nobody was in the room. He said, Zakia, I can't believe you went off script. And who do you think you are? He was just talking to me like I was his child. And I, 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 I he, and he was also was a, a black man. So again, I don't think it had to do with me being black. It probably had to do with me being a woman. So that's where the intersectionality comes in, where you don't know why someone is um, discriminating towards you, but you just know that it's happening. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. That as a as a black woman with of a physical disability, yeah, I've, I've definitely uh, you know feel you when you say that you know you, you have a bunch of these kind of hit you. And you don't really know well, which one it is. Makes you angry, really. You know, and, and, you know you're not gonna take me serious or, you know, things like that or, or have a voice or like, who voice my opinion, you know, that I'm, that I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? And things like that. So that is um, very challenging 
you know. So how do we how do we deal deal with that? Uh, well, how, how did you deal with that? And then that's my first question. And then as society, how do we begin to change those ideas and that narrative? Recommend we deal with this by a start checking the microaggressions when they're happening. And of course, you have to use a bit of common sense when you're doing it. I wouldn't stand up in the middle of the week and say, hey, did you just hear me? However, what I would do is go to the person who is facilitating the meeting and say, hey, I'm not quite sure if you know, realize I said that prior to such and such saying it. Is there a particular reason why it was not a great idea when I said it? Or if someone wants to, as we're talking about pronunciation of names earlier in the green room, and someone's like, I'm just going to call you Z. No, you're not. My friends call me Z. This is a business relationship. I prefer you call me Zakia. I help them pronounce your name, not butcher it. If you're also, um, what was another scenario? Oh, the gentleman, when he was trying to demean me for doing a, a, a phenomenal job in a presentation because he felt that he was um, not being recognized for his contribution to the presentation. I did speak to our, our next line supervisor, and I was told that perhaps I should dull my light sometimes when I'm doing a presentation. Mind you, this is a key that you get pretty much all the time. When I was working for the federal government, if I was talking to a middle manager, if I was talking to an SES or a general, I... I, I'm Zakia. <laughs> That's who I am all the time. And so, of course, I will give you your respect, but I'm down to earth. And that is how I'm able to build and maintain relationships um, across internationally. Um, so I say, you, I don't remember what the question was. Oh, what should you do? Microaggressions, you check them. And then also educate. When you're doing it, say, the reason why I was offended by this is because X, Y, Z. The reason why you cannot call me Z is because we are not friends. This is a business relationship. My name is Zakia. If they're doing anything, you let them know what they did wrong and how to go about moving forward in a professional um, relationship. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You got, and you do have to learn the skill to speak up for yourself in a professional manner, you know, as you. Yeah, well, that, that that goes a long way. But if you're afraid to not speak up, then you know, people will you know, treat you as you allow them to treat you. you know? So you have to develop that you skill. Teach people how to, how to treat you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to be that. Yes. I know a lot of people on Facebook right now say, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And everything. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and then with the stigma, how do we start challenging the stigmas around mental health and invisible disabilities? By showing up in excellence in everything that we do, by educating, by bringing awareness, not just on the job, but off the job. What are you doing in your personal life? Are you volunteering and mentoring others about um, mental health awareness. I feel that it shouldn't just be done in the boardroom, but it should be done in the community. So be the change that you want to see in the world. And we do this through education and awareness. And in organizations, we start at the highest level. I believe in this. Uh, I, I'm from the school of thought that top down approach that the leader doesn't have the buy in about why disability inclusion is a part of the overall picture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, what do you think your middle managers are going to think? How do you think your middle managers are going to interact with their subordinates? How do you think your employees at the lowest level might interact with each other? It actually has to do with changing the mindset of an organization and be giving them the tools and also empowering them to show up every single day as their authentic self, even though it may vary from what your personal beliefs are. This we're in a we're this is 2021. People come from all walks of life and have different ideals, but letting them be themselves is so powerful. And it's not just the right thing to do, but also it can drive higher morale and better um, 
it can increase revenue because when people are not group thinking, they're coming together and they'll be able to work and solve problems um, and be more competitive in a great way. Yeah, 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 I hear you. That's you know, great advice and everything as well. And so, you know, I know uh, some of the issues that we have in the um, African, African American community is fighting culturally competent therapists, you know, so that someone who can, you know, we feel that understand, you know, our challenges, and our struggles. So what would be your advice for how to get in contact? Um, I, it will still be a two-prong approach. Um, find some leaders in your organization who can be champions and diversity um, champions for change. And in the community, do the same thing. For example, um, the NAACP, uh, where I live, I um, volunteer for the organization. And I also am giving input into their new diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. Not only am I giving input, I'm also saying, hey, Yes, you have veterans, which is great. But also, can we have a line item in there that talks about mental health? So be able to, like I said, if this is something you're passionate about, no matter where you go, be that person. That, who, what you believe in is like your brand. So when I walk into a room, most people are like, that's the DEI lady or that's the mental health um, champion lady. And let that be everywhere you show up in the world, not just in the workplace. I don't want it to be cliche because this is on the back end of 2020 where we had all the social injustice and it's still going on. If this is truly something you believe in, be a part of crusade no matter where you are, not just because it's popular at this time. Remember, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. And even if you're new to this, still you can be true to this. Keep walking the walk. Yes, 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 yes. And, and are there any resources? that you can recommend as far as with finding, you know, a therapist or, you know, I know usually you can go to your insurance, but are there any other good resources to, you know, find um, good therapists? Or how, how would you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question. There's this number that you can call anywhere in the continental U.S., um, 211 on your phone, and it can give you a list of therapists um, and also there's an app that I love. It's called the Calm app. And it has, uh, I like listening. So I'm, I was, I'm a cancer. I just had a birthday earlier this month. I love the ocean. It looks brand cool to me. So it also has sounds up there that can help you. Um, and also uh, 211 gives you a list. And I just want to say about looking for a therapist. How many of you love shoes? I mean, I can't wear pumps anymore too much. But even if you're a sneakerhead, you like your sneakers or your purse or your cars, whatever it is you're into, you know that you have to shop around till you find that perfect fit. It's like that perfect, I want to say shoes because I love shoes, um, that perfect shoe. But you don't find the perfect shoe on the first trial when you're going to the mall or you're am ordering from Amazon or wherever you're ordering from. It takes multiple attempts to find it. It's the same thing for, for a therapist. You might go through the intake and say, hmm. I don't, I don't know if this person understands my culture. I'm not sure if this under person understands some of the things that I've gone through. So if you if you find yourself in that situation, it is okay. They're not offended because they want to help you. That's why they went to school for either psychology or social work. It's okay to move on to another therapist. So I recommend, again, using the app um, um, and also dialing to one for resources in your local area, whether you have insurance or not, because there are also providers that will assist you. Oh, um, uh, oh gosh, what is it called? CB. There's a, in most areas, there is a organization there that also provides mental health services on a sliding cell scale. Okay. Yeah, thank you for those resources. Excuse me, I have to try to find a um, but yeah, that's thank you for those uh, resources and everything. But, uh, um, yeah, so that thank you for those resources because I know it's a challenge, you know, to find um, a therapist, but uh, the culturally competent to feel you know be able to help you and. You know, and that's affordable because I know that, you know, 
I have a good therapist and I feel like it's easy. Thank you for that. And so I want you to go uh, into also, well, first, before I get to the next question, uh, there are, just we'll read some of the things that's in the chat because many people are comedy. So, um, so see, these are some of the things that people were saying. Uh, Tia said, yes, the main thing is also commonly used. Uh, Renee Brown said, yes, people always used to get my name That's wrong. my sister. Hey, Renee. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So irritating. Mm -hmm. um, also, Heather Holloway said, don't forget, you could have, you, you could have had them call you doctor. So you know, put some respect on it. <laughs> yes, 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 doctor. Uh, Renee said, preach. Um, also, Heather said, uh, yes, about education, about mental illness. Um, Heather said, good advice about shopping around for therapists. Um, Ash Beto said, community mental health boards. Sometimes have grant. That's what I was talking about. That's what you can go to. And they, um, the community um, service health board, that's who we're based off your income. You can get a therapist and or a psychiatrist. So that's who you will go to in your local state. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, yes. And yeah, that's true. Every county Ooh. has one um, mm -hmm. and everything. And then Renee said, hey, Dr. Z uh, Zakaya. <laughs> hey, sis. <laughs> This is so. Um, my next question really is, um, like, what are and I know everybody' experiences are different, but um, what are the top issues that you feel uh, people like you, you know, like you or people living with mental illness are experiencing? What do you think? As some of the, you said some of the issues? Yes. Acceptance. First, you have to be able to accept it yourself. And that's where I struggled really hard. So acceptance. And then you have to deal with um, attitudinal barriers that are in your educational system and also that is at, at work, meaning what people think about you, how they interact with you on a daily basis. If they think you are less than because of the quote unquote label that you have. And so how you choose or how you're able to navigate that situation makes all the difference in the world. If I was doing this interview 10 years ago, I would not have come across, I don't think, as um, confident about talking about my disabilities to others. But now that I know that I have the power to empower, inspire others through my experiences professionally and personally, it, I show up every time I get a call asking me to talk about this topic because it's so important. And I think most people can now agree because of the pandemic, the um, financial crisis, the um, social injustice. Now there's a fourth pandemic as well, which is about mental health. There's so many individuals who are going through such hard times and it is causing them to have mental health challenges. Additionally, um, because of the situation that we're in now, people are beginning to understand that it's okay to speak up. And I just take my hat off and I say a big thank you to the influencers that we have nationwide across the globe who are speaking up saying, hey, I have, I struggled with this and I'm also now a, an advocate because now people are, are beginning, I be, just beginning to understand that it's okay to be different, differently able. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those, those are really great, you know, um, kinds of different issues, you know, that, that people have. Um, and so what about kind, different kinds of policies? You know, what kind of policies are this changed? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, what kind of policies do you want to see changed of dealing with mental health? Because as you uh, perfectly have shared that, you know, with COVID, and they said that COVID, one of the issues could be, uh, you know, mental uh, type of mental health challenges, and even just 
or through this traumatic experience, you know, a lot of people are going to have some challenges, you know, after yes. this. So what are some policies? Um, policies, I would say, will be internal for the organization. And one of those being, we saw how if you were able to work remotely in 2020, you were working remotely. So I would say policies around how people show up to work. And therefore, it would also increase the numbers of individuals with disabilities being employed. There are people who work in the rural area might have transportation issues and also being able to provide the technology for the individuals who uh, will want to work. Most people do want to work because they're giving, they feel like you're giving to society. I know I do. I certainly enjoy being able to be a value add to my society. So policies, I would also, I, I would say, is also as far as housing, how uh, organizations, um, treat individuals with disabilities? Are they providing reasonable accommodation? Are they letting people know that they have a right? I have, I, I know an individual right now who had COVID. She also is um, disabled and her, her landlord has not been very understanding and actually is not extending her um, lease right now. And so I would say even in the housing industry, real estate, we need to look at how we're treating individuals with disabilities. And are we uh, making sure we have the tools in place so that they can thrive and be as successful? There's um, a young lady who came up with this term that I love, which is called survivor. Because we're not only survivors of whatever trauma and adversity we've gone through, we have the capability, each one of us, to thrive. And I love the word thrive um, because we can thrive through challenges. Yeah, 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 that's true. And I know. Uh, that they are, uh, uh, President Biden is going to extend the eviction. So, you know, that, that's going to be, you know, the challenge of the people, you know. Um, so, I, I just also want to say, if anyone have uh, questions, uh, some more questions to answer, a little bit to go through. So, if any of you on Facebook uh, have a question, Please you can put it on the comment section and we'll get to we should get to your uh, questions. And so um, we talked about policies. Um, what is your recommendation? What is your recommendation as far as being successful African American with disabilities? Find a mentor and your mentor does not have to look like you. The majority of my mentors, especially in my formative years of my career, look nothing like me at all. Um, but find someone who's willing to invest in you because when someone pours in their time in you, that's an investment. Um, find someone who believes in what you believe in. And you might not be in the same exact industry, but they could be a leader or they're really, you know, they're, they're the bomb.com or whatever it is that they do, but learn from them. Be gracious, be thankful. Um, for the people that believe into you and don't reach out to people only when you need something. Like if you're in the middle of like needing a new project or a job, you're like, oh, let me call so-and-so. No, that's not how this works. It's give and take. You have to be able to um, continue and nurture the relationship um, as you would do a flower or a plant. And so my number one advice I would say um, is to grow your network um, people who really have your best interests at heart and, and who just really just want to see you um, thrive. Um, one person, Rebecca Coakley is another person who or very early in my career where I was shy about talking about being a black, I was like a black woman with disabilities, her herself, and she's not a black woman. She was like, Zakia, you need to talk about how it was at HBCU. You need to talk about how organizations don't reach out to historically black colleges and universities and the, the nexus between that and mental health. And I'm like, okay, but it was uncomfortable for me. But she said, that's something that needed to be talked about. One of my first speaking engagements about diversity was back in 2007 and she afforded me the opportunity. So be thankful. Give, her, give people the flowers who have opened up doors for you and whether in your same age group or not, if they, they have more knowledge about a subject, 
listen, this is this this is not a dry run. I shared with you all in the green room that currently I'm in North Carolina because my family member passed away. And so whenever I start thinking about legacy and someone passes away and you think about that dash you have between the day you were born and the day that you take your last breath, you want to think about the impact and what it is that you want to accomplish. I recommend you write down a list of things that you still want to do and start making tangible steps to work towards all those things that you want to do before you leave this earth, because we never know when that day is coming. And um, it's not all about materialistic things. I recently had dinner with someone who I, I've known for a number of years. And when she was talking about all her accomplishments, they all had to do with um, materialistic things. And I said, well, one of the things I'm thankful for is my mindset has shifted over the years. I'm happy I'm in a different frame of mind. I'm, I'm blessed and thankful that I'm impacting lives. And it was no shade towards her, but you have to actually start thinking about what is it that you want to be known for? And I don't know if that's actually your Cadillac or pouring into others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we, we do have, I thank you for that. And so we do have a question. What suggestions can you give special education teachers, educators in general, and how we can be more vulnerable to this? Oh, that's an excellent question. And I, you, uh, you can see I'm the queen of shout outs. So my teacher, um, Miss Cuffey, Stephanie Cuffey, she's on my Facebook. Hey, Miss Cuffey. She was my special education teacher. On my hard days when I was dealing with a mainstream teacher and I might was having an emotional issue or not understanding the math assignment, she would snatch me up and tell me, whenever you were having a problem, come to my office. I would come to her office and she would be there to listen to me. She actively listened. She didn't condemn me for walking out of the class. She wanted to know what was the problem and how could she help me solve it. So these are all these years later that we are still connected. And it's because of her leadership. And she wasn't just a teacher. She was a coach. Just like if you haven't even played organized sports, your coach is someone that you can confide in and say, I want to be the better at cheerleading, football, tennis, golf, whatever it is. And that was that teacher for me, Mrs. Cuffey. When that other teacher said I wasn't college material, Mrs. Cuffey said, yes, you were. Mrs. Cuffey and my parents instilled in me words of affirmation and talking to yourself. So that is what educators can do. Be a coach, be a mentor, and encourage these young people that they can do anything they set their mind to it, despite the naysayers, despite the social economical background they grew up in, that has no bearing on what they can do in the future. Yeah, that's 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 excellent, and, and I definitely second, you know, uh, what you just said because that that is true. Now people, but we just say that, you know, people put so much limitations on you, or when you. A black or you know, poor and things like that. People put society puts so much limitations on you, and so yeah, to have teachers to say no and teachers um, definitely what your teachers did affirmation for what they did you definitely helps uh, tremendously. Thank you. So keep the questions coming. Um, you know we will Got questions coming. And also, I, I hope you've noticed that I said I still stay in contact with Ms. Cuffey. Again, those people who have made an integral difference in your life and an impact, stay in contact with them. Tell them thank you. I mean, I remember she just retired a couple of years ago, but I used to go by the school when I was in town and bring her lunch, bring her flowers, because I'm just so thankful that she poured into me. Because if she didn't pour into me, I would not be in this position or whatever position I was in when I was... Uh, going by her classroom. I uh, would speak to her students. I gave back. Community service is so integral. You have to give back. You have to give to other people so that they can have an opportunity to be afforded the things that you have in life. Because someone poured into you, you have to remember that. you got to pour into other people. Yes, yeah, to reciprocate. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely true. Um, and so another question I have, um, it is like, um, what else do you want people to know, you know, what it's like to live with a mental illness, you know, being black and live with mental illness? What do you want people to know? I want people to know that it is a journey. Um, and sometimes the chapter that you're in 
um, may be a little different from the one that you're going towards. And you just need people in your life who understand you, who want to understand you first, and who can meet where you are. If there's a time where you're just not being very communicative, um, for them to understand that and give you grace is is it's very challenging for the individual. And I know that it's also very in- um, challenging for the person that you love um, that may be experiencing some of your peaks and your values, you know, your ups and your downs, but also um, be able to practice grace and kindness. I think that's something that all of us in this world can use more of is kindness and people who are going to quote unquote, as the young kids say, keep it real with you. Um, Keep it real, but also know how to set boundaries. Lastly, I will say no is a complete sentence. (laughs) Sometimes you do things, and I'm sure you can relate to this to me because sometimes people might invite you to something or doing something, but you might not physically or mentally be in the headspace to socialize. So simply saying thank you for the invitation, but no thank you. And I, I would say for the people who or have someone who says this to them, just say, okay, I, I'll check in with you again later. But give that person the space to process whatever it is that they're going to, because it's not personal. Um, dealing with disabilities, mental and physical, can be very stressful and challenging. So just be the person that you want other people to be towards you. Yeah, yeah, that's you, you best facts I could say any better. You know, that you have to, I like what you said choose with boundaries and learning to, you know, develop boundaries, you know, with dealing with other people and things like that because that can cause havoc and, you know, and sometimes everyone isn't nice, you know, and they'll try to take advantage of that. But if you, you know, know who you are, grounded, you know, just, you know, <laughs> you know you're not going to do that. You're not going to disrespect me, you know, you're not going to do these things to me. And, and everything. So that's definitely great. Um, and so where can people find you to learn more information? About Absolutely. Your- um, on most social media platforms to include, if you're on Clubhouse, let's connect. I am the Zakia Mabry on Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Instagram. Um, and you can just send me an email by going to DEI at the Zakia Mabry if you're interested in having me come to your organization or facilitate any trainings. I will be most happy to have a conversation with you about it. Um, I think that this conversation was much needed. I give um, much um, thanks to you and your team for having this and also for making sure that it was inclusive for all people. There are a lot of virtual summits and there's um, conferences going on, but not everyone is thinking about everybody, um, people who need interpreters, um, people who need platforms that are accessible, um, 508 compliant. So I, I, I give you flowers, Queen Tamika, for having this idea and for having this conversation, especially now. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's you know, just with the, the current climate, it just period. We just need to have these conversations. It's not enough of these conversations. We can have either uh, dialogue. And so, before I let you go, I thought you say you I feel like I you graduated from a, 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 a HBCU. Okay. Virginia State University. Hey. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I have a nephew who I graduated. From. Morehouse. Yes. Oh, can I just graduate from Morehouse last year? Or an Anthony. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so Morehouse. Yes, I love the HBC. All right, then. So thank you very much. And and so I uh, please everyone, you know, uh head up uh Zakaya and uh, utilize her her services and and support her. And so next month, um, I will be speaking to Anita Cameron um, um, with how it is to live a uh, black and autistic. So thank you very much. See everyone.